If you go into your browser window and hit the lock icon, you'll be able to see your website's security certification. In this case, I see elliptic curves being used. Cryptographers like to use elliptic curves because they're able to generate the most secure crypto systems with the smallest key size. Elliptic curves was also a key part of Andrew Wiles' famous 1995 proof of Fermat's Last Theorem. So there's no doubt that elliptic curves are hugely important in math and cryptography. But what might be its most creative application is its use in my favorite algorithm. It's, strangely enough, an algorithm built to fail. The algorithm in question is a factoring algorithm. In the factoring problem, we are given an integer and we want to break it down into a series of numbers which, when multiplied together, give back the original integer. How are we going to use elliptic curves to solve this problem? And what even are elliptic curves? Well, besides being cool looking curves which have a hole or a cusp, the property that's most important for our algorithm is the group structure of these curves. Roughly speaking, we say that a set has group structure if we can define an operation on all elements of that set, which behaves similarly to addition. Let's say we have two points P and Q on an elliptic curve. Then to add P and Q, we draw a line through them. The line will pass through a curve a third time at a point. Since the curve is symmetric, we can reflect the third point over the x-axis and we call this reflected point the sum of p and q. Why do we denote the reflected point as negative? Well, consider drawing a line through r and negative r. We can follow the line up until the curve. So we're forced to consider this non-existent point way over at infinity as the identity element of the group of points on our elliptic curve. But it makes sense to do this. When we add a number and its negation, we get zero. On our elliptic curve, when we add a point and its negation, we get the point at infinity. They're both identity elements. When you add them to an element, you get that same element back. Let's write down the point addition algorithm step by step. The first one is just to exploit the fact that the point at infinity is our identity element. Next, we consider the case where our two points have the same x-coordinate and opposite y-coordinate, in which case they sum together to the point of infinity. Don't be intimidated by this next part. It's just calculating the slope of our line that we're drawing. If you look at the top case, it's just rise over run, the difference in y over the difference in x. We get the second case if the two points are the same. Then we need to find the slope of the tangent line at that point. Look at the equation above, and if you know calculus, you should be able to derive the formula for the slope of the tangent line. Then we can use this equation to find the coordinates of the third point that the line intersects. But there's one more subtlety we need to consider before moving on with the algorithm. Let's see what happens when we look at elliptic curves modulo a number, or taking the remainder after dividing by that number. Here, we go on to a journey to the land of modular arithmetic. Let's see the operations for which we need to consider their modular equivalents. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Addition in modular arithmetic works more or less like a clock. Hence, modular arithmetic is sometimes called clock arithmetic. Subtraction is just addition in the other direction. Multiplying then modding is the same as modding then multiplying. Modular division is slightly more complicated. It requires finding a number called the modular multiplicative inverse. In regular arithmetic, if we wanted to divide by 5, we could just multiply by 1 fifth. Here in modular arithmetic land, we're going to use the GCD to help us find the modular multiplicative inverse. 
The greatest common divisor, or GCD, is the largest number that divides both numbers of interest evenly. For example, the GCD of 12 and 18 is 6. On the other hand, the GCD of 16 and 5 is 1, since they share no factors. The GCD appears in this equation, and the extended Euclidean algorithm can give us solutions to it. It's a pretty simple algorithm, but for now let's focus on finding a modular multiplicative inverse. Just like in regular arithmetic, we want the product of a number and its multiplicative inverse to be 1. This means that a necessary condition for the existence of a modular multiplicative inverse is having a GCD equal to 1. With regular arithmetic, the only number without a multiplicative inverse is 0. You can't have 1 over 0. We'll see that having a GCD that is not 1 is like dividing by 0 in an almost literal sense. We can rearrange the equation, and negative BV doesn't have any remainders when dividing by B. So AU multiplies to 1. It's the modular multiplicative inverse of A. At this point, I want to pause for a moment and contextualize everything we've talked about. Elliptic curves have group structure, which means that you can add points together, but this requires you to calculate the slope of a line going through one or more points. But remember, this algorithm requires looking at elliptic curves modulo a number. So when we do a division calculation to find a slope, we also need to find the modular multiplicative inverse of a number. And when we use the extended Euclidean algorithm to calculate that modular multiplicative inverse, we require the GCD to be equal to 1. At this point, you should have everything you need to be able to reinvent the algorithm. Can you come up with a factoring method from everything we've learned so far? Pause the video, rewind, and consider the title of this video your final hint. 3, 2, 1. Okay, the secret is to consider the case where you don't get a GCD equal to 1. That means there's a common divisor and we factored the number. But when would that ever happen? Well, let's say we were trying to add this point to itself over and over on the curve. Using the slope formula, we need to do modular division, which means we need to find the modular multiplicative inverse of 11. This requires the computation of the GCD of 11 and 187, which is 11. 11 is not equal to 1, which is what we needed to find our modular multiplicative inverse. So the slope is undefined as if we divided by 0 and we fail to get a point from addition that isn't the one at infinity. But, but hey, at least we know 11 is a factor now. The algorithm leverages this idea and it takes random elliptic curves and keeps adding point to itself repeatedly until we run into a point addition that makes us run into a GCD that's not. It stands to say that this algorithm, invented by Hendrik Lenstra, Lenstra's elliptic curve factorization algorithm, is an incredibly clever algorithm. Perhaps more intriguing is that this algorithm doesn't just fail, but accomplishes its goal by failing to compute a value. If only math tests were like that. Thanks for watching.